Hi, so today we have this very rare and unusual object to take a look at. This is the light valve assembly from a General Electric Talaria video projector. Now I'd never imagined I'd actually be able to ever get hold of one of these. I've seen one or two on eBay in the US. I doubt many of the projectors made it to the UK. Scrolling through listings of a, an eBay seller that specialises in ex-military and like government surplus and saw this sort of fairly misdescribed but I happen to know exactly what it was. The reason for that is that a few years ago I discovered another large old large screen projection technology called the IDA4 and went down a big deep rabbit hole finding out about this fairly amazing piece of tech. It's one of those bits of tech that's so ridiculous you know you can't imagine it could possibly work but it actually had pretty much the whole large large screen video projection market from the 1950s up into the 1990s. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail of that because a few years ago I actually did a talk on it at Hackaday Belgrade events. So I'll link down to that video below so if you want to learn more about the, um, the IDA4 there's um, lots of information in that talk. So basically this is a sort of development of that IDA4 technology and it's intended for use in large screen video projections of the size that were too big to use sort of CRT style projectors obviously this was decades before things like DLP and LCD based projectors and the basic principle it uses Schlierian effect optics now I'm not optics expert but it's the sort of thing you sometimes see when you see visualizations of things like hot air rising from a flame and the basic setup is that you have an optical system where you focus some sort of aperture it could be like slots or just an edge and then pass it through either an optical system or just a volume of air and then focus it onto another aperture in such a way that when everything is perfectly lined up no light passes through the, for example if you're passing through if you're using slots you, the light comes through the slots and they then get focused on the solid areas between the slots of another aperture or sometimes the same one if it's a mirror type arrangement but the basic idea is that when everything is absolutely perfectly lined up no light passes through but the slightest disturbance to the optical characteristics of that setup means that light passes through so what both this and the ida4 use in slightly different ways it's a very thin film of oil and they then scan that oil using an electron beam similar to the uh, the way a crt works and that builds up a charge on the surface of that oil which produces a, sur a surface distortion of the shape of that instead of the smooth surface because you've got like charges they repel each other so it produces a disturbance of yeah, tiny amounts your micron sized disturbance on the surface of that oil and that's enough to affect the light coming through optical system so from the CRT scan you effectively get a spatial light modulation that with appropriate optics can then be uh, projected onto a screen. What's particularly interesting about the Solari is that I actually managed to do colour using a single tube using a, yeah, a mixture of different apertures, there's some different filters there, I believe it also used polarisation but I've, I can find almost no information about this particular implementation, there's a few bits of information here and there, I'll link down to look below to some GE internal papers that describe some of the details of the, the research but those all seem to apply to like fairly significantly older versions of this and this is the only one that I've ever seen your know, actual hardware for which is the single tube color version which apparently didn't work particularly well because of the way you know the color system wasn't wasn't great but it did have the massive advantage of being a single tube so it didn't have all the alignment uh, problems that you have when you have more than one projection system that yeah, GE did make three yeah, two and three tube versions of this and I've seen pictures of like three individual projectors red green and blue but obviously those needed a lot of alignment and setup. We'll t take a little detailed look and see what we can actually figure out from this because say there's almost no technical information out there particularly about this um, this version. Now some of the stuff that you can see here is packing so for example these plastic these are just two plastic tubes which are just protection in transit so these just, just come off and there's also this little wire with sort of crock clip lead just to hold these these steady and this just plugs onto some um, so the pins on there so this is just sort of purely transit protection and at the back we can see that these there's these sort of dichroic filters which are sort of magenta at the top and bottom and green in the center and at the side here we have what looks like an electron gun but I don't think it actually is this looks very much like the neck of a cathode ray tube so with the standard sort of pin base with a sort of connector that, that plugs onto it so I'm sure this is sort of fairly standard but 
But if we actually look closely, if that's an electron gun, it seems to be firing straight into just a piece of mesh. There's these sort of bead things above it. I suspect these are probably to avoid oil getting into the, um, the electron gun. Maybe also some um, perhaps moisture absorption or something. But say, if this is an electron gun, you know, there isn't really anywhere for the electrons to come out because it's just firing straight at this mesh. If you look at this centre, you know, this, this doesn't look like there's a hole through it for the electrons to um, get through. So what I'm guessing, and this is a total pure guess, is this could actually just be a vacuum gauge. There's only four wires going to it. There's uh, sort of two fairly heavy wires and two other wires, although there's quite a few more pins. So I can't really think that that's any more than a vacuum gauge. So back here, I think this is probably the electron gun. I believe this only scans an area of about an inch or so across, so it's probably electrostatically deflected. Um, there are a lot of pins around here, but I've, I haven't yet figured out exactly where all those go, so those could perhaps go to electrostatic deflection plates inside. And on this side we've got this lens mount here, which this is a cover on here, if we take this off. We can see some sort of gratings here. I think this is part of the aperture system for the Schlieren optics. I think these are probably just covers for maybe the glass evacuation um, nipple there. And there's a couple of motors, and these are magnetically coupled to something inside the glass. One of these will be to drive the glass disc. So there's a glass disc that runs through a reservoir, to, so it's got a film of oil on it that the um, electron gun scans. So there's a couple of motors here. If we look into here we can actually see those magenta and green filters and there's a rotation adjust so if you rotate this we can see a sort of moire effect so there's clearly some sort of aperture grille to match the pattern of this one somewhere else in the, um, the optical path and if we take the uh, lens off we can actually see these two um, sort of aperture grills more clearly um, the lens itself doesn't look anything particularly exotic so apart from this um, aperture grill thing on the uh, front Taking that off, it looks like it's a fairly conventional sort of multi-element lens. I can't really tell how many um, elements there are on this. And this is the actual grill, so it's just a fairly very thin mesh covered in matte black, obviously for optical reasons, to prevent spurious reflections. And just on the edge of the uh, end of the lens as well, looks like a temperature sensor here. I imagine yeah, th this thing does rely on sort of very precise um, alignment, so it may well be that it sort of needs to be temperature controlled and sort of set up at a particular temperature to avoid any uh, movement. And on the lens mount there's a number of shims, obviously the distance, the mounting distance of this was critical, so they use these shims to um, get the distance exactly right. And here we've got a motor, there's a, just a synchronous motor with a gearbox and some magnets which obviously couple the motion into the glass assembly in here, obviously this thing's under vacuum. And this is a simple um, rotary encoder down here. And there's also this screwed down onto the lens. I'm guessing this is probably a temperature sensor. I wonder if actually this is to do with like sense making sure there's no sort of thermal differential between here and the um, projection lens, just to make sure everything's totally lined up. Perhaps this, yeah, maybe that's a heater, and there's um, some way of actually better just getting the whole thing thermally balanced. Yeah, this is a, just an M334 temperature sensor in here. And there's a second motor here with a little chain drive. Again, driving a magnet to couple the movement into the uh, inside the glass. And both of the motors have these um, cans. I'm sure this is for magnetic shielding, because obviously this thing's using electron optics. So if you've got a magnetic field from motor coils, that could affect it. So um, this might be um, something called mu metal, which is um, designed to sort of provide shielding against low frequency uh, magnetic fields. It used to be very common wrapped around things like um, oscilloscope CRTs and so on, where you need to shield from the effects of external magnetic fields. Down here we had this. This is a uh, sort of transit shot detector, which is clearly uh, tripped. It looks like it just holds um, ball bearings using springs between these sides, so any sudden shock it will push it out and you can tell that it's had uh, some sort of tr shock in chipping. So just taking out the shell we've got um, the actual tube and these orange things are actually heaters, there's like multiple sections. So this is clearly to get this glass up to a specific temperature for the oil to uh, do what it needs to do. Just a rough idea of how fast these motors turn. Um, these are 120 volt motors, so they may well be designed for 60 hertz, so they're probably running a bit slow here on 50, but uh, just to get a rough idea of the sort of speed. So we've got the actual glass out. These are the heater assemblies. They're just sort of, sort of flexible heating elements. It says 30 watts, 
here 20 watts of that section 30 so perhaps about 100 watts in total so not sort of stupidly hot you can actually see the oil in here but it's not moving so i think yeah, it, at room temperature it's like a gel and i wouldn't be surprised if there's some instructions in the manual that says you know wait for this to cool down before you move it because i can imagine having this oil slopping around would be a uh, a good thing i don't know how well partitioned um this is internally it seems to be sort of multiple sections sort of stuck together with this adhesive that doesn't really feel like like a sort of glass frit type thing it feels like it's some sort of resin i believe the life of these was about a thousand hours and i saw a figure somewhere of a running cost of approximately um 150 pounds an hour which is presumably the, the lifetime of this so yeah these are big expensive pieces of kit for professional use they weren't home projectors by any means so here we've got what looks like the vacuum um, seal off and again that seems to be covered with some sort of resin and we've got two motor couplings here um, we can actually see some gears so because this this oil is sort of solidified it, it won't turn so i think i might try heating this up just to the point where we can actually get it turning to see uh see if we can figure out what these uh these do so we've got these two shafts here this one's sort of sticking out then if maybe this is an oil reservoir and this is like doing all oil circulation on this one and perhaps the actual disc rotation on that one so that i can see a sort of set of tooth gears around here and there's another gear here which is probably the coupling from here into that um, i think i probably will end up doing an extreme tear down of this because it's not really any use as it is or it looks quite interesting but there's yeah there's so little information on this online it'll be interesting to actually look at the internals to try and get a better idea of how it works and here there's like a very smooth very clear optical window here and again it's glued, glued in with this white um, resin you can see the uh, aperture and the um, color filters at the back and if we look really closely i think this must be the electron gun with these four deflection plates surrounding it i think the connections to those plates must be on here there's there's this sort of line here so i'm guessing there's maybe very thin wires running from these these terminals here through into the, to the inside, inside of the glass and there's, there's like sort of metal can which i'm guessing is probably magnetic shielding on the inside back end we've got this set of um, filters so these are sort of magenta and green in transmission obviously they, they work by reflection so they're sort of cyan and sort of red reflection uh, that don't don't seem to be any polarization related stuff there so i did read that they use polarization but perhaps that was external or maybe that was from a different version and then there's this sort of molded lens assembly and there's also some sort of moldy molding in the back of here and you can just about see there's some i think some metalization here which forms the apertures on this end so obviously the light source would be behind here there's probably a fairly complex optical system to get the light from uh, what would be a fairly powerful yeah maybe one two kilowatt xenon lamp to sort of funnel the uh, the light into here these little uh, studs these are just alignment there's sort of some gaps on here and these are like asymmetrical studs so this will only go on one way because of the uh, alignment of these um these little pips with the uh, gaps here you can see a little bit more of the electron gun here and some additional rings here with some wires going off to these um, terminals around the side and i'd imagine this is designed so that this electron gun can be replaced somehow because that that's the other filament in here is probably the thing that deteriorates over time obviously this thing's not being so expensive i think they probably would have actually had a system for you know taking this apart to some extent and rebuilding it rather than just uh, throwing it away because obviously it had been a very expensive uh, spare part some of these wires from these pins around the outside do actually go through holes in the glass sealed up by this white um, resin stuff so this would be things like those deflection plates and maybe some other internal connections to the um, the electron gun okay so i've warmed this up i think this oil sort of starts to flow at about sort of 50 60 degrees so it's not super hot but so you can see it's now just about flowing it's a fairly gloopy no idea what you know how loopy or otherwise this uh, actually is in operation but it is enough to get the um things turning you see that um gear is on the edge of the glass disc so if we just rotate that see it's moving this is a bit faster than it would normally operate it's pretty pretty slow all it's got to do is maintain a sort of a stable oil film across the glass over time it will like build up charge and so I had this running for times so you can now just see the, the film starting to move across the uh, window
it's not really clear exactly what this one's doing it, you know you do see some motion inside i think it's just some sort of circulation pump or something just to uh maybe maintain stability i think you might have to um get this open to find out a bit more okay so uh, time to see if we can get this thing open i'm just going to um sort of try and dremel this off to uh, release the vacuum first <clears throat> haven't heard any hissing but there's a little bit of bubbling going on now at that end so i think there's maybe a little bit of oil there that the uh, air is getting past okay this uh, dremel diamond wheel is actually fairly effective at cutting through this white stuff but i think there's maybe quite a lot of it so um let's see how we go not the neatest job but it's come apart in roughly where I wanted it to right, now it's cooled down a bit this oil is just really sticky and goopy it's like a bit like honey it's just sort of sticking to everything so I think I'll uh, leave this on a hot plate for a while just to try and drain it off okay let's take a look at this assembly now it definitely is an electron gun I also don't think it's a vacuum gauge. Basically, I've just traced out and looked at which things are connected. And basically, we've got these two banks of metal discs. And there's just a single wire through each section. So there's one section through the top and one from the bottom. Not a filament. It's like a maybe a 02 mil diameter wire. And those wires are the only things that have electrical connections to them. So my best guess for this is that it's basically a hot wire which is designed to help decontaminate the vacuum from whatever's come off the oil or out gas from somewhere so you've got this very hot wire and these discs are just heat absorbers to just take that heat just to avoid that wire burning out so you can maintain a sort of at a high, high enough temperature to do what it needs to do on the surface of the wire the these discs just then just absorb that heat avoid overheating and burning out i, I really can't think what else this could possibly be and the base looks very much like it's yeah, probably a standard crt base it's even got sort of these missing pins which is quite common for focus electrodes and so th yeah this is almost certainly an off-the-shelf crt base connector and you see there's actually some sort of discoloration which suggests this does run pretty hot and so normally on a, a crts they've got this extra isolated pin so the uh, focus electrodes on crts run at quite a high voltage i think sort of two or three kv so it's quite common for them to have this missed out pin and some extra insulation around um just that pin but so i think they've probably done this just to use an off-the-shelf crt base connector only four of these pins are actually connected to anything and th those both appear to be the um these heater wires so this is the middle section so that was the view we saw from the front and looking from behind we can see we've got two sets of four deflection plates from the uh, scanning the electron beam and this outer this is magnet this is a magnetic shield around the outside here and these uh, cute little glass uh, feed throughs just passing the wires through some glass they're insulated with some uh, glass tubes just to connect to these um, eight deflection plates and the final bit at the back we've got um, these plates around the um, this electron gun of course those eight plates may not have all been for deflection some of them might have been just focusing and beam shaping but with four four so they could adjust the um, yeah, beam characteristics in uh, multiple dimensions again we've got these four little plates here which again could be deflection and or beam shaping focusing and the electrons come out of this this little hole in the middle and you can see the um, the aperture pattern printed on the uh, the back 
some sort of yeah, metalized uh, coating you can, here you can see these patterning sort of optical patterning um, some sort of lens going on there and the um, the electron gun here it's a uh, very thick glass it's about um, quarter inch sort of five six millimeter thick glass obviously that's probably for structural stability um, plus you know, the fact that this is all glued together rather than blown as a single piece but obviously the um, precision and mechanical stability of this was uh, very important and cost wasn't really an issue either so these are maybe just like molded glass pieces that were then sort of glued together okay these are the various um, parts of the pump so the actual pumping action is these two sort of gears here so the oil, oil just gets goes through there then it goes through a couple of extremely fine filter meshes say gets a quite cool more effect between them but say these are very very fine filters and these sort of go through these plates so it passes through the filter and then through some channels at the edge to the next layer and then it sort of ends up coming out of this tube and this is the glass disc grocer assembly so the oil sort of goes in through here across the back and then it comes out of this slot which sort of spreads it across the surface of the disc um, this is the actual disc that's mounted with this um, gear ring on the outside so we have the uh, the drive that comes from the external magnet drive goes onto this um, gear on the back and then there's the pinion on here that drives the edge of the last disc and there's a ball race in the middle we've got this flat um, window just bonded onto here to give a nice obviously a flat optically flat surface for the uh, light to go through so this sort of sits this way so the oil the actual oil film is on the back obviously for the uh, electron beam to hit it and uh, what's interesting is this drive wheel for the yeah the external magnetic coupler it's got this encoder slots on it now this thing goes so slowly that this can't be to do with any sort of synchronization i think this simply is to detect that the oil is thin enough for it to actually rotate because when the oil's at room temperature it's like this really very very sticky sort of goop like you know like very cold honey but with a sort of slightly rubbery sort of texture and it needs to be heated up before it will actually flow so i think this is simply detecting that this is actually rotating this is driven by synchronous motor so the speed for that would normally be constant so when the oil's at yeah, room temperature it's too goopy for this thing to turn so this just won't turn and these this encoder and these slots are just simply to tell it that the um the thing's actually moving and it probably uses that to avoid firing the electron gun on a stationary target which might cause problems i've had to um sit these pieces up like on a hot plate with some kitchen towel for like a couple of days just to soak as much of that oil out because it's just horribly gunky sticky stuff but just sort of soaking it away at, at about 100 degrees c um it's just got these these uh, pieces into a reasonably uh, separatable form it's interesting this electron gun is made of ceramic rather than glass i wonder if maybe that's just because it's run at a, like a particularly high temperature because all the yeah, conventional crts tend to use a thoriated tungsten filament which runs at like a orangey red heat but um without the that thorium coating they tend to run like a much, much hotter so i wonder if maybe that's um why this is made of ceramic I know on the um, the Ida 4, well, you know, one of the reasons that the filament life on that's fairly low is for some reason they couldn't use the thoriated filament. I think that might have been something to do with the oil, the presence of the oil. Right, just to get an idea of what's going on in that oil surface, I've just got some of this oil um, heated up so it's fluid in a metal pan. I've got a probe on the top. If I just fire some high voltage at it, that should create a charge on the surface. You can see how the um, the surface deforms as a result of that charge. You see it sort of forms into lumps Also, you've got these like charges sort of trying to repel each other and i think you know the shape and size of these are going to depend on the voltage but also very much on the physical characteristics of the oil the oil has, has also got a very carefully controlled conductivity so that the charge dissipates at a fairly well controlled rate you want it to not last significantly more than one frame time so that it's ready for the next frame obviously the, the this is deforming much more than the actual film would would be in the um in the Tellaria system and of course this effect does actually work with normal oil this is just normal general purpose lubricating oil so there's clearly some very interesting stuff going on here I'm not sure that we've actually managed to um, shed too much more light onto this 
you know, specifically how that colour system worked, whether it, and, you know, okay, you can see the two different colour filters on there, but, you know, there's only two colours. And, you know, how was that actually, you know, how, how did the signal differentiate between those two colours? Were they projected onto different areas of the scanned area, or was there some sort of field sequential type thing? I've read somewhere that there was polarisation involved, but, yeah, there's no polarised components in this. Obviously, there might have been some additional optics around the lamp, and perhaps after the... Um, the lens that did something um, with polarization but um so if anyone's got any information on this then please put it in the comments because I'd, yeah, I'd be really interested to know a bit more um i have found a few documents that i'll um link to below so you can sort of read a bit more uh, about it and there's also my talk about the original ida4 so yeah there's still quite a few mysteries here and it'd be interesting if anyone um, can help clear any of those up